In this video, I'm going to give an introduction to the mathematics and the physics of, of the three modes of heat transfer that we're going to study in this course, conduction, convection, and radiation. In addition, I'm going to introduce the concept of using thermal circuits to represent our physical systems in order to calculate heat transfer. The governing equation that we're going to think about in this course is the conservation of energy equation, where if we think about a particular control volume, we see that the rate of change of energy being stored inside that control volume is given by the difference between the amount of energy which is going in and out of the control volume through the surfaces, plus any energy that is converted from other forms of energy into thermal energy inside the volume, which we denote as uh, the rate of energy generation, thermal energy generation within the volume. And so we're talking about energy per unit time. So energy, of course, in the SI system has units of joules, and we're talking about energy per unit time, and so that has units of joules per second or watts. We're going to calculate the rate that thermal energy passes through materials or from, one sur from a surface to a fluid moving over it, for example. And we're going to calculate those in, term in two different ways. One we'll call the heat rate, which is the thermal energy per unit time which is being transported from one place to another. And we'll give that the symbol Q, and of course it will be joules per second for energy per unit time, or watts. We may also be interested in the heat transfer from a surface to another surface or from a surface to a fluid passing over the surface, in which case we can divide the heat rate by the area and talk about the heat flux. So the heat flux is simply dividing the heat rate by the area and I'll denote it with these two dash symbols on our Q, so we'll get Q double dash, and that will of course be in joules per second per meter squared or watts per meter squared. And we will, as it's convenient, use either heat rates or heat fluxes as we describe heat transfer in this course. Conduction heat transfer is governed by Fourier's law of conduction. Of course the heat rate or the heat flux is a vector quantity and it can have components in each of the three coordinate directions in a three-dimensional system. Fourier's law tells us that the heat flux vector is equal to the conductivity which is a material property times the area through which the heat is being transported times the temperature gradient in that material and of course there's a negative sign because heat moves from high temperature to low temperature and in order to get that sign right we need to use a negative here in front of the temperature gradient. The heat flows against the temperature gradient. And in a Cartesian system of course we could look at the x component of the heat transfer and that gradient would be represented by dt dx or the gradient is dt dx uh, in the y direction, we have a component of the heat flux vector, which is the conductivity times the area, moving against the, the temperature gradient in the y direction. And likewise in z, we have the conductivity times the area times uh, the temperature gradient in the z direction. If we wish to represent it as a heat flux, we're simply dividing by the area, so now it's just minus k times the temperature gradient, or in component form, qx, q double prime x, q double prime y, and q double prime z. The thermal conductivity, as I mentioned, is a material property. It changes for different materials, and we'll look at this a little bit more in the upcoming module. But the units of the thermal conductivity are watts per meter kelvin. Of course, you can look at Fourier's law and see that this works. If the conductivity is watts per meter kelvin, the area is meter squared, and the temperature gradient is kelvins per meter, which is going to result in a heat flux and a heat rate vector having units of watts. And just to get a sense of the sample values for this moment, conductivity of air is somewhere on the order of 0 0.026 watts per meter kelvin. And that's why air makes a very good insulator if you can keep it from moving. The conductivity of liquid water is about 0.6 watts per meter kelvin, so two orders of magnitude higher than the conductivity of air. And that might explain uh, part of the reasons why you feel much colder uh, when you're in water than when you're in air. And a good electronic conductor like copper also has a correspondingly high thermal conductivity, so copper has a thermal conductivity of somewhere on the order of 400 watts per meter kelvin. If we look at one dimensional conduction, and so we'll look at the x component, qx, and we'll say that the x direction is going through this pink slab, uh, we can see immediately from conservation of mass that the heat rate in watts, which is moving from this side of the wall to this side of the wall, if it's one dimensional, it's not changing. That's going to be constant through here because it's got nowhere else to go. It's coming in, it's going out, and so it's constant everywhere along there. And if that means that if Qx is constant and the material property is constant, and from this geometry, the area is constant, 
that means the temperature gradient must be constant. And therefore, we know immediately that the temperature distribution is a straight line between T1 and T2 for this one-dimensional case with nothing else going on but heat transport through the surface. Convection is that heat transfer from a surface to a moving fluid above it. When a fluid impinges upon a surface initially far away from initially and far away from the surface, it has a velocity u infinity. When it hits the surface, the velocity is going to be zero at the surface because of the no-slip condition. The fluid is not sliding across the surface. It has a velocity of zero at the surface, and hence a boundary layer is formed, and we see this velocity profile, which eventually reaches the u infinity value or the free stream value of the velocity. If the temperature of the surface is different than the free stream temperature, we will likewise see a temperature profile where we have some behavior of the temperature going from that surface temperature out to the temperature of the fluids uh, far away from the surface at t infinity. Now, of course, if we look very closely at the surface where the velocity is zero, we'll have conduction heat transfer with the conductivity of this fluid leaving the surface. But as soon as it gets a little bit out into this fluid, now this velocity is going to advect or carry the thermal energy down with the movement of the fluid. And that's going to result in a change of this temperature profile. Know that it's, notice that it's no longer linear because of this fluid motion. We'll talk about that in more detail in a later module. But for now, we're going to talk about how we describe it mathematically in a nice simple form. And that, that is using Newton's law of cooling. Newton's law of cooling says that this heat rate Q is simply equal to another constant, the convection coefficient, times the area of the surface, times the difference in temperatures between the surface and the free stream temperature T infinity. Of course, we can describe it as a heat rate or as a heat flux simply by dividing by the area. This convection coefficient has units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. And of course, it must have those units. The area will have units of meter squared. The temperature difference will have units of Kelvin or centigrade. Of course, when it's a difference, it doesn't matter if it's centigrade or Kelvin because once I subtract them, the difference will be the same in either set of units. And so the convection coefficient, of course, has this in order to make the units of the heat rate watts. And in general, should we get a feel for this, that if the fluid is a gas, the convection coefficient will be smaller than if the fluid is a liquid. Likewise, if we're experiencing free convection, the motion that's due to buoyancy forces, uh, not as in the picture described here, where we're driving a fluid across at a, at, a, at a velocity u infinity, this is called forced convection. And in general, the convection coefficient for forced convection will be higher than that of free convection. We can think about convection coefficients being on the order of 10, say, if we have a gas, and it can get up into the hundreds or even the thousands and beyond if we have a liquid. In the case of free convection, again, we might expect um, convection coefficients on the orders of tens, and into forced convections, we can get into uh, convection coefficients again well into the thousands and beyond. Next, I'm going to talk about radiation. And first, uh, radiation is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And we have to consider that some new surface properties in order to understand what's happening with radiation. First, I'm going to talk about the emission of radiation from a surface. Any surface, which is at a temperature above absolute zero, so any surface, emits radiation in proportion to the temperature of that surface. And the Stefan Boltzmann law tells us that this emission of black body radiation, which means the maximum possible emission from an ideal, thermodynamically ideal surface, is equal to this constant sigma times the area times the temperature of the surface raised to the fourth power. And because this is raised to the fourth power, we always have to use units of Kelvin when we talk about radiation. And if we have a real surface, it's not going to emit the maximum of the thermodynamically ideal surface, but we have to introduce a surface property called the emissivity, which ranges from 0 to 1, which tells us how much radiation the surface emits compared to the black body. So this is the black body radiation, and this number, the emissivity, uh, tells us how much less our actual surface is emitting. And of course, if we divide by the area, we can express this in terms of the heat flux. We usually draw the radiation with this squiggly line, perhaps to remind us that it's, uh, it's transmitted through electromagnetic radiation, and it doesn't require any medium in order for the heat transfer to occur. So, it, of course, we know that the radiation reaches us from the sun on the Earth, passing through the vacuum of space, and radiation can pass through a vacuum. It does not need a medium.
For reference, the Stefan Boltzmann constant is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And again, if you look at the equations, you can see that those are the units they have to be in order to make sure that we have a heat rate in watts and a heat flux in watts per meter squared. At the same time, a surface is going to absorb radiation from the surroundings. So whatever the surroundings at the temperature of the surroundings will be emitting, just like the surface, and some of that irradiation is going to be absorbed by this surface. Well, we can describe the amount of radiation absorbed by the surface uh, to be related to the emission of its surroundings. And because it's completely surrounded, um, it can well be described as the, in the, with the black body equation, so sigma t surface to the fourth. And now we introduce a new surface, pro surface property, alpha, the absorptivity, pardon me, the absorptivity, which describes the percentage of that radiation uh, that is absorbed by that surface. And there's a special class of surfaces which are very often used for engineering approximations, and that is the assumption of a gray surface. When we have a gray surface, we can say that this absorptivity is equal to the emissivity of the surface. So for a gray surface, the amount of radiation that is absorbed from the surroundings is epsilon, because it's equal to alpha, times uh, the area times the black body emission of the temperature of the surroundings. And so when we put that together to look at the net heat transfer from the surface, of course the difference between what's coming in and being absorbed and what's going out is the net heat transfer going out, and for a gray surface that's described with this expression here which we can use in our calculations. Again, remember radiation has to be always calculated in units of Kelvin um, as we have this fourth power of the the temperature in these governing equations, and radiation is emitted by any surface which is above absolute zero, that is zero Kelvin. Now I want to talk about the a thermal circuit representation, which we'll use quite a bit going forward in our conduction analysis, and or as well as some of the problems in the first module of the course. And so perhaps we remember when we studied circuits that if we impose a given voltage difference across a resistor, then we will get an electronic current going through that circuit which is given by Ohm's law, which tells you that that electronic current is equal to the difference in voltage between the two sides of it, divided by the resistance, the, the resistance in ohms of that resistor. And if we remember also from our circuit theory, um, that if we have multiple resistances in parallel, for example here, two resistances, R1 and R2, connected in parallel, so that a current coming into it will divide itself between R1 and R2, and then combine together to the full current coming out the other side. If we have a total current I coming in here, we'll have that same current I going out, and we'll have I1 going through resistor 1 and I2 going through resistor 2, such that of course I is equal to I1 plus I2. And if we want to combine those into a single combined resistor so that we can look at a circuit like this, uh, we can combine those in this way. And again, apologies, this of course is R2. Uh, in order to get a single resistor representing these two resistors in parallel. And if we have two resistors in series, we simply add the two resistances in order to get the total resistance for those two resistors. We'll see this again over and over when we do uh, thermal circuits. So the thermal circuit can be obtained by realizing that Ohm's law looks identical to Fourier's law for heat conduction. And so if we have some material which has, which of course will have a thermal resistance, uh, put between a temperature 1 and a temperature 2, then there will be a heat rate going through that material, which is related to the thermal resistance of that material which is there. And just like in Ohm's law, that heat rate can be calculated by saying T1 minus T2 divided by the thermal resistance, exactly like voltage 1 minus voltage 2 over the electronic resistance. And of course, if we want to talk about a heat rate, we would divide by the area. And so we can talk about this R double prime, an area-specific thermal resistance, in order to calculate a heat flux. Let's see what this looks like for each mode of our, um, for each heat transfer mode that we're going to talk about. So first, let's talk about conduction. If I look at, again, the x component of our heat flux going through this material in the x direction, it's given by Fourier's law. Because I know that I have a linear temperature distribution in this case, I can describe this temperature gradient as 
T2 minus T1 over the thickness of this material, L. And then multiplying through by the negative, I'll get T1 minus T2. Well, if for my thermal resistance, I wanted to have the heat, flux, the heat rate was equal to T1 minus T2 over R thermal. And so the R thermal for conduction then has to be L divided by Ka. And of course, the area specific thermal resistance for conduction is simply L over K. Moving on to convection, starting with Newton's law of cooling, I can again see if I want to describe this, this heat rate, as a temperature minus a temperature divided by a thermal resistance, that that thermal resistance would have to be 1 over the convection coefficient times the area. And if I was using an area-specific thermal resistance, it would simply be 1 over H. And finally, in the case of radiation, uh, for a gray surface described by this situation here, we can make it look a lot like convection and simply say that the, the thermal resistance due to radiation is 1 over A heat transfer coefficient for radiation times the area. And manipulating this equation here, this is exactly what the heat, the, the heat transfer coefficient for radiation has to be. And now we can combine all of these modes into thermal circuits. We'll start with a, a brief example of this in the next video, and then we'll look at this significantly more in Module 2.